Hello everyone. Welcome back to my channel. I'm Dr. Durga Singh and I'm back with yet another important topic that is radiology and emergency. So now let's proceed forward. Radiology and emergency First, I want to give you the overview regarding topics covered in this video. So this radiology and emergency video will be uploaded in parts. In part 1, we will discuss topics like in head, we will discuss epidural hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage. In neck, we will discuss about acute epiglottitis. In thorax, we will discuss aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism and pneumomediastinum. In subsequent parts of this video, we will discuss the remaining topics. Please note few emergencies like acute cholecystitis, acute appendicitis, etc. We will discuss about them when we will discuss ultrasonography, CT scan, etc. So now let's proceed further. First, I want to make the concept clear about three types of head injury that is epidural hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage. We will see the difference between them. First, I want to discuss about the normal anatomy of scalp, skull and the meninges. First of all about the scalp. First thing we see here is the hairs on our scalp. These hairs are attached on the skin, below which are the closed network of the subcutaneous tissue, then lies the aponeurosis, then the loose subaponeurotic tissue and the innermost layer is the pericranium, then lies the skull bones. The skull bones towards the outside are covered by the pericranium which is the outer periosteum and towards the inside the bones are covered by the inner periosteum of the skull which is actually the outer endosteal layer of dura mater which is continuous with the pericranium through the sutural ligaments. Just focus on the marked markings. The inner periosteum of the skull bones is made by the outer endosteal layer of the dura mater. Actually, the cranial dura mater has two layers, outer one, the outer one is the endosteal and the inner layer is the meningeal layer and along the lines of separation of these two layers lies the dural venous sinuses. The arachnoid mater, follow the black line, the arachnoid mater is closely applied to the dura separated by the subdural space and the pia mater, follow the purple lines. Uh, these lines every indentation of the brain. The space between the arachnoid and the pi matter is known as the subarachnoid space. Keeping in mind these basics, now let's differentiate between the EDH, SDH and SH. So first EDH. The bleeding occurs between the skull bones and the outer endosteal layer of the dura mater. The source of bleeding is arterial, that is middle meningeal artery. It occurs due to the high velocity impact, for example, road traffic accidents. It mainly occurs in the young patient who present with lucid interval, which means period of consciousness between two episodes of unconsciousness. On CT scan, the bleeding is seen as lens-shaped bleed, which is limited by the sutures. We will see this again. Second, we will discuss about subdural hemorrhage. Here, the bleeding occurs between the meningeal layer of the dura mater and the arachnoid mater. It usually occurs in old patients as their brain undergoes atrophy, so the bridging cortical veins become taut. So on trivial trauma only, for example fall from bed, these veins are torn and cause the bleeding. Patient presents with altered sensorium after few weeks of trauma. And on CT scan, the bleed is seen as a crescent shaped, which has no suture limitation. And the third variety is the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Here, bleeding occurs between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter, and the source of bleeding is arteries involved in the formation of circle of villis. Most common cause of SH is trauma, but most common cause of non traumatic SH is rupture of cerebral berry aneurysm. It can occur in any age group, be it young or old. The patient presents with severe headache, actually the worst headache of his life, neck rigidity, vomiting, altered sensorium because of the meningeal irritation by the accumulated blood. And on NCCT brain, the hemorrhage is seen as a linear hyperdensity, that is, the sulci are seen filled with blood. 
This is so because the arachnoid matter and the pia matter closely follow the sulci and the gyri of the brain. Now moving forward. So the first question. A 25 year old male met a road traffic accident. He becomes unconscious at the site of accident. Local people took him to the hospital where he becomes conscious without any external injury. So got discharged. In the evening time, he again become unconscious, reached the hospital and diagnosed with epidural hemorrhage. What investigations should the doctor do in case of any RTA to avoid this again? Uh, okay, first tell me the phenomena which is described here. Yes, it's lucid interval that is the period of consciousness between two episodes of unconsciousness. Coming to this question, remember the investigation of choice and also the first investigation for any case of head injury is NCCT brain that is non-contrast CT brain. Now the see the scan of this patient. What do you see? Can you see a biconvex or a lentiform shaped hyperdense area? This is typical of epidural hemorrhage. See the bleed is limited by the coronal suture in the front and the lambdoid suture behind. But this bleed can cross the midline and frontal area as there is no metopic suture in the idols. Please remember the lucid interval is common in EDH but is not exclusively found in EDH only that is it can be found in other cases as well. Again revise, it's because of the rupture of the middle meningeal artery in the space between the bone and the endosteal layer of the dura mater. Uh, now see the second question. A 65 year old male presented to the emergency department in an unconscious state. There is no history of diabetes mellitus, hypertension or any trauma. On repeated questioning, relative tells that he fell from his bed around 23 days back but it was all okay in this last 23 days. NCCT was performed and we get this film. What's the diagnosis? Okay, see, this is an old patient with history of trivial trauma. Uh, see the NCCT scan. Appreciate the crescentric hyperdense area. This is a case of chronic subdural hematoma. This subdural hematoma is not limited by sutures but it can't cross the midline as it is restricted by the dural folds, example Fox cerebri. This is due to the rupture of the bridging veins. Remember, SDH can be acute when it presents within 3 days, can be subacute when it presents between 4 to 21 days, or it can be chronic when it presents after 21 days. The investigation of choice for acute and chronic SDH is NCCT, where acute bleed appears hyperdense and the chronic bleed appears hypodense. And the investigation of choice for the subacute stage is MRI. Also remember, the subdural hematoma can be seen in cases of battered baby syndrome because of the shearing tension between the dura and the brain when the child is shaken. Uh, okay, now moving forward, next question. A 23-year-old male metro traffic accident reached the emergency department in unconscious state. NCCT was done. What's the diagnosis? Okay, see the scan. What you see here? Can you appreciate the sulcal linear hyperdensity? These are actually the sulci filled with blood. That is, blood is in the subarachnoid space. Yes, that's a case of traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Actually, the most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is trauma, but the most common cause of spontaneous non-traumatic SAH is rupture perianeurysm. The source of bleeding are the arteries and their branches involved in the formation of circular villies. Uh, remember, the investigation of choice for acute subarachnoid hemorrhage is NCCT, and the investigation of choice for cerebral aneurysm is CT angiography and the best investigation for cerebral aneurysm is DSA digital subtraction angiography. Moving forward, the next question. A four year old boy with high grade fever and chill, respiratory distress with toxic look visited the emergency department. He was seen sitting in a tripod position and having strider. What's the next line of management you will do? Uh, will you do an urgent x-ray soft tissue neck AP and lateral view? Okay, we did and we get this film. What do you see in the lateral view x-ray here? Uh, follow the red arrow mark. Appreciate the swollen epiglottis. 
its thumbprint sign or the vallecular sign of acute epiglottitis but the acute epiglottitis is an emergency diagnosed on basis of clinical features we can't wait for this x-ray finding so our next line of management should be immediately establishing the airway by intubation or tracheostomy it's an emergency we can't wait for x-ray or anything like that um after establishing the airway we can go for other treatments like fluids or iv antibiotics uh okay tell me what's the most common organism responsible for acute epiglottitis yes that's streptococcus pyogenes now let's see the next question question says a 65 year male with history of hypertension presented to the emergency department complaining pain in the interscapular area and soon collapsed you as the physician suspected aortic dissection how will you investigate uh remember investigation of choice for aortic dissection is ct angiography see the ct angiography of this patient can we appreciate two lumens in the ascending aorta because of the dissection one is the false lumen and the other is the true lumen because of the hypertension which is actually the most important risk factor for aortic dissection intimal tear is triggered so now the blood flows in the vessels layer between the intima and the media that's why two lumens but please note the patient is unstable here he is collapsing we don't have time to perform the ct angiography so the investigation of choice for unstable patient is trans esophageal echocardiography tee please note that this tee is equally sensitive and specific if done properly by the operator please note that aortic dissection is classified according to two types of classification one is the dbk classification where there are three categories one is the involvement of both ascending and descending aorta two is the involvement of only ascending aorta and three is involvement of only descending thoracic aorta other is the stanford classification where there are two categories dbk1 and 2 correspond to stanford a and dbk3 correspond to stanford b why this kind of classification because the involvement of ascending aorta is dangerous if it involves the coronary arteries it can lead to myocardial infarction so we need to operate the cases involving ascending aorta on a urgent basis while cases involving the descending thoracic aorta can be managed by medical means also one question here which beta blocker can be utilized in cases of aortic dissection yes that's esmolol which allows permissive hypertension uh moving forward the next question a 65 year old female known case of malignancy wanted to stay with his parents for few days she took the flight from london to india later on presented in the emergency department with sudden onset breathlessness on clinical examination nothing specific found other than pulse rate of 120 per minute what's the name of the scoring developed for the suspected pathology okay first tell me what's the suspected pathology see a female with female patient with hypercoagulable state took a long distance flight presented with dyspnea and tachycardia and auscultation also nothing specific from pulmonary embolism is suspected in this case the investigation of choice for pulmonary embolism is ct angiography uh, see the scan of this patient can you appreciate the saddle shaped embolus sitting at the bifurcation of the main pulmonary artery please note the chest x-ray in majority of cases is seen as normal however few signs can be demonstrated in few patients let's know them first is the palas sign it's dilated right descending pulmonary artery hampton's hump it's a wedge shaped lung opacity because of the infarction chang sign it's abrupt cut off of the right descending pulmonary artery because of the blocked by the thrombus westermark sign uh, that is pulmonary oligemia and the fleshner sign it's dilated main pulmonary artery now coming back to this question what's the scoring developed for pulmonary embolism uh, please note the scoring is modified well scoring which tells the probability or the likelihood of developing pulmonary embolism the scoring is 
थ्री स्कोर फॉर साइन एंड सिम्टम्स ऑफ डीप पेन थ्रोम्बोसिस डीवीटी थ्री स्कोर्स इफ ऑल्टरनेट डायग्नोसिस इज लेस लाइकली वन पॉइंट फाइव स्कोर इफ पल्स रेट इज मोर देन हंड्रेड दैट इज टैकी कार्डिया वन पॉइंट फाइव स्कोर इफ द पेशेंट इज इमोबिलाइज फॉर मोर देन सेवेंटी टू आवर्स और हैज अंडर गॉन एनी सर्जरी इन लास्ट फोर वीक्स 1.4 स्कोर 1. सॉरी 1.5 स्कोर इफ हिस्ट्री ऑफ पलमोनरी एम्बोलिज्म और डीबीटी इन द पास्ट 1 स्कोर इफ हेमोप्टसिस इज प्रेजेंट एंड 1 स्कोर इफ हिस्ट्री ऑफ मेलेग्नेंसी इज देयर विद इन द लास्ट 6 मंथ्स इफ टोटल स्कोर कम्स आउट टू बी लेस देन 2 इट मींस पेशेंट हैज लो रिस्क फॉर पलमोनरी एम्बोलिज्म If the total score comes out between two to six, means the patient has moderate risk for pulmonary embolism, and if it's more than six, means there is high risk of pulmonary embolism. So that's modified well scoring. Now the last last question for today. See the question: A 40-year-old male alcoholic, after few episodes of forceful vomiting, presented in the emergency department with chest pain. On examination, subcutaneous emphysema was present along with crunching sound on sound on auscultation. What's the diagnosis? See, the patient is uh, having a typical macular dread that is chest pain, retching, and subcutaneous emphysema that is typical of Boerhaave syndrome. Here, the esophagus ruptures, leading to pneumomediastinum. Pneumomediastinum means free air is present in the mediastinum. Please note the initial investigation would be chest X-ray, but investigation of choice to look for presence of air anywhere is CT scan. On chest X-ray, let's see the findings. See the first film. Appreciate the continuous diaphragm sign. This is because the air collects beneath the pericardium, so the central part of the diaphragm becomes visible as well. Uh, see the second film. Appreciate the V, the air outlining the descending aorta and the left diaphragm. Uh, this uh, V is classically described for pneumomediastinum secondary to esophageal rupture. This is known as Naclerio V sign. And see the third film. Uh, appreciate the Spinnaker sail sign, which is actually air outlining the thymic lobes in a child. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for the subsequent parts of this emergency and radiology series. Please like, share and subscribe and ask your doubts in the comment section.